Okay, so good evening, everyone, and welcome to our tutorial session. Uh, we're going to take up some biochemistry pearls, and this is lifted on the high yield topic uh, regarding lipid and fatty acid metabolism. Now, I mentioned earlier regarding uh, textbooks, which are being used by the official syllabus by the PRC for the physician's licensure examination. And this would involve Harper's Illustrated Biochemistry. Okay, They actually use the international edition and some Lippincott uh, Biochemistry, which is the seventh edition. Now, in addition to this, I would like to share with you that there were there were some tables that were lifted and it was actually lifted from the older edition okay the 31st 31st and 32nd are actually old editions and this is under the topic or the chapters of metabolism of acyl glycerols lipids of physiologic significance and fatty acids and echinoids now, all of these three chapters, which I mentioned, are actually going to be taken up in detail during our master class. Now, we're going to begin with the first thing everyone has to memorize when it comes to lipids, carbohydrates, and proteins. And this is regarding how much energy is yielded. Now, always remember lipids slash fats, okay? would yield nine kilocalories per gram. Now, question, how many or how much energy is yielded by carbohydrates? If lipids and fats is nine, what about carbohydrates? Okay, carbohydrates is four grams. Very good. Okay, very good. So I'm glad you guys are engaging. Now, what about proteins? Okay, what about protein? How much? Okay, proteins is also four. So the numbers to memorize, I'm going to give you a shortcut. Just memorize the lipids because that's the only one, which is nine. Both carbohydrates and protein is nine okay so please take note of that now i want everyone to remember that aside from uh yielding energy or being a good source of energy lipids are also protein sparers and they are very very important for the absorption of the fat soluble vitamins now can anyone here recall in the group what are the fat soluble vitamins what are the four fat-soluble vitamins? Okay, what are the four fat-soluble vitamins? We know this is going to come out, okay? This is, of course, ADEC. Vitamin A, D, E, and K. Now, question. Which of the fat-soluble vitamins is teratogenic? Which is teratogenic? Which of the four fat soluble vitamins is teratogenic? It is vitamin A. Okay. Vitamin A is teratogenic. So please take note of that. Okay. It is teratogenic. Now, which of these four fat soluble vitamins which of these four fat soluble vitamins is synergistic with the mineral selenium okay it is an antioxidant there are only two fat soluble antioxidants that is vitamin a and vitamin e but which of these antioxidant fat soluble vitamins is synergistic with vitamin which is synergistic with selenium okay it is vitamin e okay it is vitamin e very very important 
because both selenium and vitamin E are required by glutathione, okay, which is a free radical scavenger or a free radical protector. It's a, okay, it's going to protect our body, particularly the RBCs from free radicals, okay? So please take note of that. Now, this is your guru guide, okay? As to the caloric values, which we mentioned earlier, carbo is four, proteins is four, while fats, only fats is nine, okay? So nine, nine, four, or however you wanna memorize it. Now, uh, this table is actually not in the textbook, but if you read the paragraphs and you were to create an organizational chart, it's basically going to look like this. There are actually four major types. There are actually four major types of lipids, but there's only three that you have to memorize. One is the simple, okay, the simple lipids here, then we have the complex lipids, then we have, lastly, the derived lipids. Now, of these three major classifications, which of them plays a very important role in the cell membrane? Is it the simple lipids, the complex, or the derived? Which plays a very important role in the cell membrane, okay, which plays a very important role in the cell membrane. Okay. It's going to be, of course, the phospholipids, okay, which is the complex. So please take note of that. Now, I would like everyone to remember this. Our fats are going to be divided okay, into natural dietary fats, okay, and the fats which are basically the products of the three classifications that we mentioned earlier, whether simple, complex, or derived. Now, of the natural dietary fats, the one that you have to memorize is really the triglycerides. This is the famous dietary fat, okay? Now, question. If someone has elevated triglycerides, or let's just mention the term hypertriglyceridemia, what is the drug of choice that you would give to treat hypertriglyceridemia? What is the drug of choice? Okay, I'm seeing several answers. Statins, there's phenofibrates, okay, there's one best answer here. What do we give if it is the triglycerides which is elevated? Again, what do we give if it is the triglycerides which is elevated? Okay, what do we give? Okay, now take note. If it is the triglycerides which is elevated, then we should give fibrates. Okay, the group of lipid lowering drugs, which we call the fibrates, where in phenofibrate would be the prototype. Now, statins inhibit what important enzyme? If you want to lower the LDL, and yes, it does also lower the triglycerides, but fibrates have a better effect in lowering the triglycerides. So this is the famous HMG-CoA reductase inhibitors. The statins, they inhibit HME, HMG-CoA reductase. Okay, just add the CoA there. Now, tip. This is what we call the statins, the HMG-CoA reductase inhibitors. This is the rate-limiting enzyme in cholesterol synthesis. 
either rate limiting enzyme in cholesterol synthesis. Okay. Now, I want everyone to be familiar with the term polyunsaturated fatty acids, okay, also known as PUFA. Okay. Now, always remember about 80 to 90 percent, so majority, majority of these PUFAs are actually found in the plant oils. So you've probably heard of the term omega, omega, omega. Okay. So please take note of this. Now, question, which is associated with coronary artery disease? Is it saturated or is it unsaturated fatty acids? Which is associated with which is associated with coronary artery disease? Okay. It is the saturated fats. Okay. The saturated fats. Saturated fatty acids are the ones associated with coronary artery disease as well as atherosclerosis. Okay, please take note of that. Okay, now the saturated fats, take note, majority are found in animal fats. Now, what type of meat? is associated with cancer, particularly gastrointestinal cancers. What type of meat? What type of meat? Okay. It is the red meat. Okay. The red meat are the ones associated with cancers. Now, there is a drug. It's actually an NS aid, which is chemo preventive. It is chemo preventive for gastrointestinal cancer, particularly colon carcinoma. What is this NS aid? What is the name of this NS aid? Okay, what is the name of this NS aid? Which is chemo preventive. It actually prevents colon carcinoma. But it increases the risk for peptic ulcer disease. Okay, so that's your hint. It decreases the risk of colon carcinoma, but it increases the risk for peptic ulcer disease. Okay, very good. That is aspirin. Okay, it is stated in our Harrison's that aspirin is chemo-preventive. Okay, it is chemo-preventive. So please take note of this. Okay, again, please take note of this. So these are just examples of the saturated animal fats. So we have meat, poultry, poultry skin, okay, chicken skin, butter, okay. And if you like buttered chicken, oh, there you go. Congratulations. So it's like eating a tub of lard, okay. Now, I want to mention this. This one is the one that came out in the board exam. Trans fatty acids, okay? What are the trans fatty acids? These are actually the byproducts of the saturation of fatty acids. And these byproducts occur as a result of hydrogenation or what we call the hardening of these oils, okay? And this is seen in the manufacture of margarine. Dude, margarine is tasty, but it's not, okay, something 
which you should be taking much of because the consumption of trans fatty acids is dangerous to the health. It is detrimental as stated in our textbook. And this is associated with cardiovascular disease and it is associated with diabetes mellitus. So please take note of that, the trans. Now, let's look at the clinical correlation, which is found in Harper's, okay? Trans fatty acids will compete with the essential fatty acids. Trans fatty acids are dangerous. They promote hypercholesterolemia and they promote atherosclerosis. Question, what is the first step in atherosclerosis? What is the first step in atherosclerosis? Okay, very good. It is the laying of the fatty streak. Okay, the laying of the fatty streak is the first step in atherosclerosis. Now, there is a term which we call in internal medicine as well as pathology that there is a vulnerable plaque. You are actually not afraid of atherosclerosis per se, but you are afraid of the complications of atherosclerosis, such as plaque rupture. So what is the description of a vulnerable plaque? Two very important parts you have to remember in pathology. A plaque has a cap. Okay, actually, we call it a fibrous cap. And it also has a core. So it has a cap and a core. What is the core? This is a lipid core. So if there is a blood vessel here and there is a fatty streak, what happens is foam cells, inflammatory cells, neutrophils, macrophages, platelets. There's going to be platelet aggregation until you form a plaque. Now, this plaque is considered to be vulnerable if it has a thin fibrous cap and a thick lipid core. Okay, If it has these properties, thin fibrous cap, thick lipid core. This is the one that ruptures. And what happens when a thrombus travels to a distant site? What do we call that? When a thrombus travels to a distant site. So it can occlude a blood vessel. It can go to the heart. It can go to the brain, go to the lungs. This is now an embolus. So this is a classic example of thromboembolism. So again, what is considered a vulnerable plaque? It's a thin fibrous cap and a thick lipid core. So always remember what drug is pleomorphic, anti-inflammatory, and it stabilizes the plaque. Can anyone tell me what drug is anti-inflammatory and it stabilizes the plaque? It is the statins. Okay, now always remember when it comes to plaque stabilization, rosovastatin is better than atorvastatin. Okay, rosovastatin is better than atorvastatin. Please take note of that. Okay, now this figure is found in your Harper's, wherein you have the omega family, omega-9, omega-6, and the omega-3. Now, questions. Which of the omega families? Dalawayan. Which of the omega families are the essential fatty acids? Is it the 9, the 6, or the 3? There's actually two. Okay, it's omega-3, that's correct. 
It's the three and dalawa. Dalawa yan. Only one here, only one family in this slide is not essential fatty acid. It's the nine. So the essential is three and six. Okay, your true essential fatty acids is linolenic acid and linolenic acid. So what happens to these fatty acids? They undergo beta oxidation. Question, where does oxidative phosphorylation occur? When we say oxidative phosphorylation, this is the production of ATP, which is coupled or connected to the electron transport chain. So this is the mitochondria, okay? The mitochondria is where oxidative phosphorylation occurs. Make sure everyone gets that. And yes, tama yung inner mitochondrial membrane. Do not even attempt to enter the testing site if you do not know that the inner mitochondrial membrane is the site of oxidative phosphorylation. Okay? Now, question, where does beta-oxidation occur? In what organelle does beta-oxidation occur? In what organelle does beta-oxidation occur? It's right in front of your nose. Look at the slide. Anyone? I want everyone to type it in. Okay, very good. It is the peroxisome. Okay, it is the peroxisome. So disorders of the peroxisome. Remember, the beta oxidation of very long chain fatty acids is found in the peroxisome, not the lysosome, because the lysosome is a digestive organelle. The peroxisome is where the beta oxidation of very long chain fatty acids occurs. Okay, so please take note of that. Very long chain fatty acids. That's why the peroxisomal disorders has a problem with long chain fatty acids. Now, I swear this will come out in the boards. The clinical correlation of the peroxisomal disorders or the very long chain fatty acids. That's what we call very long chain fatty acids, VLCFA. This is Zellweger syndrome, okay? This is an inherited absence of peroxisomes. So what happens in Zellweger's? There is no peroxisomal function. Therefore, very long chain fatty acids cannot undergo beta oxidation. This is a life-threatening disease. Most Zellweger's will not be able to survive within the first year of life. Severe neurologic disease, hypotonia, seizures, failure to thrive, failure to develop because of the important role of fatty acids, particularly in the myelin sheath, in the neuronal membrane as well. So Zellweger's is the first application. Now write this down if you want to top the exam. Pipicolate oxidase. <coughs> That is the enzyme deficient in Zellweger syndrome. The okay, pipicolate oxidase. Now, the second is Refsum's disease. Refsum's disease is another neurologic disorder. We don't see it much often. Refsum's is a peroxisomal disorder. 
it is associated with the accumulation of phytanic acid. So I usually remind students, the first three letters of refsome is ref. What does the ref or the referee do in a game? They prevent players from fighting. Okay, fighting sounds like phytanic acid. So basically, this is what your book says. There is a pathologic effect on the membrane function, a pathologic effect on gene expression. Okay, so this is Refsom's disease. Now, enzyme mentioned in the 31st edition of Harper's is phytanoil CoA. Phytanoil CoA. So please take note of that. Then I have one last disease as we end this quick session, this quick tutorial. Okay. This is also found in your textbook. This is Jamaican vomiting sickness. Now there is a tree. Okay, this is found in the African continent and the sub-Saharan uh, region. The Aki tree has a fruit and it is a culture. Okay. So it's found in the sub-Saharan, African, as well as Jamaica. Okay. That's why it's called Jamaican vomiting sickness. Ingestion of the unripe fruit of the Aki tree is associated with a toxicity. There is a toxin known as hypoglycine. This is the one that causes hypoglycemia. Okay, now this is lifted verbatim from the textbook. Hypoglycine toxin inactivates medium and short chain acyl-CoA dehydrogenase. So this would now inhibit beta oxidation as well as give the clinical manifestation of hypoglycemia. So again, what are the three clinical correlates for peroxisomal disorders? Number one, can anyone say or can anyone type? What is the first disease? Okay, the first disease is Zellweger syndrome. <clears throat> number two is Refsomes. Okay, number two is Refsomes disease. And lastly, is going to be Jamaican vomiting sickness. Now, your reading assignment is to open the ECDB portal, go to the subject or the course biochemistry, and watch the video Lipids of Physiologic Significance. It's about a one hour video. Lipids of Physiologic Significance. Okay. So this ends our quick uh chill out session our tutorial i hope you got something this evening <laughs>